All right. You guys ready to look at God's word this morning? Father, as we get ready now to open your word, we're asking that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts and minds to understand and comprehend, and Holy Spirit, that you will give us the grace and the empowerment to apply it to our lives, to walk it out, Lord. We're here because we want to know your word better. Through that, Lord, we'll know you better. We know ourselves better. And so, God, we give this time to you, this time in your word. We ask your blessings be upon it. May the teacher come, the preacher come. May your will be done. Amen. All righty. Would you open your Bibles with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 10. And I know what some of you are thinking. What? Hebrews 10? Don't worry, we are moving into chapter 11 today. In fact, we're going to be reading a a bigger chunk of uh, scripture than we normally read. So I'm pleading with you. This is church. I hope you brought your Bible or at least a device that you could pull it up on, pull it up, turn into it. I think it would be really good to have your eyeballs in God's word. My words don't matter. His do. Amen? With that being said, don't get very scared, right? Our main text for the morning is going to be just the first three verses of Hebrews 11, but we're going to read it in a bigger context uh, so that we can uh, have a a better understanding of how it fits and what the author has written. Of course, when the author is writing Hebrews, he's not breaking it up into chapters and verses. That's something that we've done in, in our Bibles. Um, so with that in mind, repetition is our best teacher. That's what I was taught when I was in school. So let's have a, a brief review, not only of what's happening here in chapter 10 and chapter 11, but it, just a brief review of what's happening in the context of this book that we have been studying. The author of Hebrews, as you guys know, is writing to a church, a Hebrew church that is really, let's be honest, they're struggling. They're struggling in their faith. They're, they're facing very trying times, difficult times. There's heavy persecutions, trials, troubles, temptations. And as a result, many of them are beginning to doubt. They're beginning to waver. They're beginning to, what did I get myself into? Very much like you and I do. When we reach trouble, problems, difficult circumstances. God, where are you, right? What, what's going on? What's happening? We begin to doubt. We begin to worry. We get anxious. We get fearful. Not only that, but apparently, according to the text, there are people in this church that are beginning to drift away from Christ. Maybe they're not gathering anymore. They're not attending anymore. This is a little bit too much. I, I didn't sign up to be a radical Jesus freak, you know? And they're backing off. They're backing away. In fact, according to the text, uh, some of them are even walking away from faith in general, just completely turning their backs on Christ and his church. And so the author of Hebrews is writing to challenge them. And his main thing is to encourage them to have this enduring faith in God. He reminds them of the greatness of Jesus, how Jesus is greater and better than anything in this whole entire world. He reminds us that Jesus is everything that we need. It is because of him, our sins are forgiven. It is because of him we now have access into the very presence of God. It is because of him that we have a hope and a future that is secure and that is absolutely, absolutely mind-blowing. Last week, we finished up chapter 10, and that's exactly what he was telling them. He was calling them to endure, to continue in their faith by telling them to remember what God had done for them in the past so many times. Oh, I'm never going to, how are we going to do, how are we going to, and God got them through just like he will in this trial, in this season of life. Not only does he remind them to remember what God has done, but he reminds them to remember what's at the end why we are enduring, not just to endure, but because there is a finish line and baby, it's awesome on the other side. He reminds them to remember that God has promised to reward them for their faithful service, for their endurance. He has promised us everlasting joy 
and the eternal pleasures of his presence. A kingdom where it is he and us and us and him forever and ever. It's in this context that the author of Hebrews is now going to shift into chapter 11, which is what we're going to be looking at. If you're familiar with Hebrews 11, you know it's, it's called the Hall of Faith, right? These are the home run hitters. These are the, the heavy hitters. These are men and women that are, are great examples of faith that as we work through that text, we're going to look to want to be like them, right? I'm reading and I'm like, I want that. I want to be like that. So we're going to endeavor in our study through Hebrews 11 to look at how we can apply those principles to our lives to be people of faith like they are. So as we read through our text this morning, I'm going to ask you to pay very close attention to how the author talks about faith, how he's going to define faith, how he's going to describe faith for us as Christians as believers and followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as we go through the text, here's the thing. Everybody, everybody says they have faith. They have faith in something. They they have faith in someone, right? I mean, we're in a political season. All of a sudden, faith is important to everybody that's running for office. My faith is important to me, right? What, What does that mean? Right? What, what are you saying when somebody is saying they have faith or it's important to them or, or what is it? What are they talking about? Right? Is it biblical faith like we're going to be looking at here? Is it something else? So with that in mind, are you with me in Hebrews 10? Let's look at verse 32 just by way of remembrance and context. Hebrews 10, 32, the author says, but recall, remember the former days when after you were enlightened, right? You, you, you left Judaism and you've turned to Christ and Christianity. Spirit of God has, has brought this revelation to you. You've repented, you believed. Remember, right? You endured a hard struggle, this intense fight, and you suffered. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. Sometimes you were even partners with those who were treated that way. For you had compassion on those in prison. Remember, these are in prison because of their faith, not because they're criminals. And you joyfully, what a powerful statement, joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, right? Not because they're lunatics and they're crazy, but because they knew there was something more, right? Look, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one, Oh, don't get me wrong. They didn't have it right there and then, right? It wasn't right in front of their physical eyes, if you were. But where others would see destruction and loss, these people saw hope and a future that brought them great joy, even in the midst of of loss, because they were looking with eyes of faith. He says, you know what God has waiting for you and that's what you're hoping in. That's your hope. It's something better. It's something abiding and eternal. Verse 35, therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. Cross the finish line. It's awesome. For yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith, right? That becomes his, his main theme from here on out, faith. He's gonna showcase this faith. faith. He's, he's gonna define it and describe it for us, especially here in chapter 11. He says, we're gonna live by faith for, for the person who shrinks back. God says, my soul has no pleasure in him, but that's not gonna be us, right? We aren't of those who shrink back because of obstacles, because of persecution, because of loss, because things don't go our way. We aren't of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but we are of those who have faith, excuse me, and preserve our souls. Chapter 11, verse one, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Do you see how this ties back with what we just read in in chapter 10 with this idea of better possessions? an abiding one. This hope isn't some kind of wishful thinking, but rather it is a confident knowing that even though I don't see it right now, even though it is not right before my physical eyeballs, I see it by faith, right? 
I see. What, what is the it? What is the it that we see? It's God's promises. It's his word. That, that's where our hope is. That's what the hope is all about. I know that God has amazing things in store because he has said it. He has spoken. He has promised, right? Faith says, I am sure of it. It is the conviction of things not seen. There it is again, right? It's, I don't see it just yet, but it's coming. It's coming. For by it, by this, this kind of assurance and, and conviction, this kind of faith, by it, the people of old receive their commendation, their approval from God, Right? So then that's the definition he gives us there in verse one and verse two. And then he's gonna spend the rest of the tra- uh, chapter describing it and illustrating it for us. So let's just read a little bit more. Verse three, by faith we understand that the universe, something we see was created by the word of God, something we can't see. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible, but invisible, the word of God. He spoke and there was light. Verse four, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was approved. He was commended as being righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith, even though he died, he still speaks. By faith, are you seeing it? this, this by faith thing? By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended. Here's that word again, as having pleased God. And here's the thing, without this kind of faith, it is impossible to please God. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Because guess what? He's invisible. You can't see him. And if you think you do, You can talk later. He's invisible. Those who believe in God, I mean, they they have to draw near to God. They must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events, what? As yet unseen, in reverent fear, he constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, This evidence of faith, right? He condemned the world and he became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called uh, to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, look at this, not knowing where he was going, right? This isn't some kind of blind faith, right? This is a man that had a very big promise from an even bigger God, And so even though he didn't have all the information, he walked and he went knowing that God had this promise. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of that same promise. The author of Hebrews gives us some great insight here. Abraham just wasn't looking for grass to feed his cattle. He wasn't just looking for water sources and wells. Look at what verse 10 says. For he was looking beyond that, forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. He was looking to something eternal, something that was abiding, something that was lasting. Verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. You remember God gave him that promise? God took Abraham for a little night stroll and he said, look up at the sky, buddy. You see those stars? Count them for me. It's like the one, two, two, three, right? Counting stars, he said, that's what your descendants are gonna be like. Did Abraham get to see that in his life? It's not a trick question, no. No, look at what verse 13 says. These all died in faith. In this confident assurance, right, of things hoped for, this conviction of things unseen, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Faith, right? I don't know if you've ever paid attention to how often that word is used in our culture. 
<clears throat> in our day and time here in 2020. And just thinking about it, I, I realize people use faith in, in all kinds of different ways. In fact, they'll use it to mean all kinds of different things. For example, maybe you've heard this one. You just got to have faith. I think it's a song, right? Just got to have faith. No? Nobody knows that song? Woo! Interactive Sunday morning. Okay. All right. All right. Michelle knows it. Not surprised. Not surprised, right? You just got you to have faith. I mean, you know, this isn't something that just Christians say, unchristians, non-believers, right? Whether they're Christians or not, they'll say, hey, you're in a difficult time, right? Hey, Jody, you just got to have faith, man. You just got to believe. You just got to believe. Just, just got to have faith, right? Just got to have faith. And, and I'm thinking, believe in what? <laughs> you want me to have faith in, in what? In, in luck? In, in chance? In putting out some positive vibes in the universe? Like, what are you telling me to believe in? Just believe. What are you, what are you telling me to have faith in? Just have faith. What, what are you saying? Right? As I was thinking of this, it, it came to me, I realized that most people, when they're saying this, what they're saying is, you need to just have faith in yourself. You need to just believe in yourself. You can get through this. Maybe we've even said it. You're strong enough. You can get through this. Just believe in yourself. Right? Just have faith in yourself. You're going to get through this. Is that not a popular message of our day? What's important is you just believe in yourself. You can do anything. I believe I can fly. You guys know that song? Obviously, that guy's never tried to fly. Another way that faith is often spoke of as is some kind of feeling, right? Just kind of like a positive thought. You, you got to be positive. You have to have a positive outlook towards life, right? You, you got to have faith. You, you got to believe. You got to stay positive. It's just going to work out. Anybody ever have talks with anybody other than yourself? You guys, some of you are looking at me like, I don't even know what he's saying, right? No, you talk to somebody in, in a difficult thing, even in uh, the, the virus thing that we're in, they're not even Christians. What do they say? Oh, well, you just, just believe. Just got to have faith. We'll get through this together. Believe in ourselves. Believe in one another. We'll get through it with faith, 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 faith. Everybody talks about it. Now, personally, I hope and, and I'm trusting and believing that not only from the, this chapter here that we're studying and going to study, but through what we know with the rest of scriptures, we can see that these examples are not what the Bible would refer to as faith or what we would call biblical faith in the sense that it's the kind of faith that pleases God, in the sense that it's the kind of faith that God is looking for and that he has promised to reward. Biblical faith, my friends, is not you and I believing in ourselves, hoping in ourselves, trusting in ourselves. It's not you and I believing in, in luck and cross our fingers and, and, and trusting and, and being positive, sending out positive vibes but rather biblical faith is a call for you and I to trust in a person, specifically in God. So as we try to better understand or define and think through that concept of, of biblical faith in regards to something that's going to please God and something that he wants to reward in our lives, as it says there, they were commended, they were approved. That, that's the kind of faith I'm interested in. Right? I hope that's the kind of faith you guys are interested in. Right? So as we try to define that and think through that this morning, look back at Hebrews 11 verse 1 with me. And while you're doing that, if you're taking notes, some of you, my copious note takers, number one, let's put it like this. We need to understand biblical faith. Right? Understand biblical faith. And then I'm going to give you an A and a B as we try to define that and think through that biblical faith. Verse 1 of Hebrews 11 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It is the conviction of things not seen. What we see here in verse 1 is, is what's known as a parallel statement. That means the second phrase it just repeating the first phrase or idea just in a different way. 
But as we look at this, I think those are two good words for us. Assurance and conviction. The ESV, in my opinion, does a really good job of um, not, not interpret, yeah, interpreting those words. What's the word I'm looking for? Translating those words, right? Assurance and conviction. If you, if you look that up, you'll see that both of these words carry this idea or this meaning of confidence. There's a, a confident assurance. There's this confident conviction, if you would. And as a matter of fact, as I was thinking through and studying through this, I thought that would be a really good word for us, confident. So that's gonna be the word that we use this morning. So then for letter A, underneath point one, as we try to better understand this idea of biblical faith, I'm just gonna keep it real simple and then we'll define it, uh, define it a little more, describe it a little more. Letter A, it is a confident trust in God. A confident trust in God. Of course, that's a confident trust in who he is, but even more so as we see in our text, it's a confident trust in what he says. It's a confident trust in what he has promised. It's a confident trust in his word, which for me is in a digital format, so it doesn't fly all around while I'm trying to preach. It's a confident trust in God, right? Our text says that it is a confidence. It is this assurance about things that are hoped for, which by the way are often things that are unseen. Even the Apostle Paul says we don't hope for things that are seen. We hope for things that are unseen, things that are not yet realized, right? Hence the word hope. So we see that biblical faith is, is a confident trust in God and his promises and his word, even in himself, in things that are unseen, something not seen. Notice that he's not saying it's a confidence in something that is not real. He's not saying it's, it's some kind of foolish, ignorant confidence in something that's not true, and something that is illogical or unreasonable. It's just not seen, and I would add, yet. It's just not seen yet. Now, of course, we're specifically talking about God's word and his promises, his kingdom, those spiritual realities, when we talk about the unseen and, and uh, those things. But uh, I, I was trying to think of another example of how this might work so that for some reason, Christians get this, like we're idiots because you believe in God, because you believe in something you can't see. Wow, you're, you're irrational. It's illogical, right? But I'd, I'd like to give just a real quick couple of examples how, once again, I'm going to call baloney on you because you don't treat it that way for anything else, right? People are like, I'll believe it when I see it. I believe it when I understand it. <laughs> baloney. You don't want to act that way for anything else in your life, so don't even try that with God, right? Here's just a quick example for us as Christians. How many of you saw Jesus die on the cross? Now, I'm pretty sure I know who the oldest person is here. Holly K., where are you? No, I'm totally joking. I'm totally joking. Don't, I'm going to have a bad week. Let's, let's erase this from the video. Let's erase this from the video, right? None of us were here when Christ died, right? But just because we didn't see something doesn't mean that it's not true. Doesn't mean that it's not real. Doesn't mean that it's not rational. Amen? We didn't see it, but it's very much real. Here's a, another non-religious example, right? For those that I'll believe it when I see it. Can you see gravity? I don't have anything. How many of you can see gravity? If you raise your hand, you know you're in trouble. And none of us can see gravity. It's invisible, right? So then, I'll believe it when I see it. Go jump off a cliff. See what happens. I mean, if, if it's not, you can't see it. It's not real, so it's not going to affect you anyways, right? You're just floating there because you can't see it. It's not real. Nobody does that. Because you're not an idiot. Just because you can't see gravity doesn't mean it's not real, that it's not true. You can see its effect on things because they fall down. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. We call that gravity. But even though it's an unseen force, an unseen reality, we believe in it. 
You believe in it. We can see the reality of it, the effects of it. We just don't see it itself. That doesn't make us illogical, blind, leading blind weirdos, right? Same thing is true with biblical faith. Biblical faith is not a blind faith, this irrational faith. It's not hoping in hope, right? Hope and hope. It's not believing and believing and trusting and just trusting yourself. God doesn't call us to just believe in anything, right? He doesn't just call us to just trust in anything we want, to just put our hopes in anything, just because we don't see it, right? And lies and untruth. Biblical faith is just the opposite. It is a confident trust in what is true, in God's reality. Even though I may not be able to see it right in front of me right now, it is true. Because he is true, and everything he has said, he will do. Somebody said amen. You see, I can see the reality of God. I can see the reality of his word, just like I can see the reality of gravity. I'm not a fool to believe in gravity because I can't see it. And I'm not a fool to believe in God just because my physical eyes don't see him. I'm not a fool to understand how gravity works and that if I try to jump up right now, I'm going to fall to the ground because I see the reality of it. I've encountered and I experienced in the same thing. It's not a fool for me to hope in God's promises, even though I don't see them right now. Amen? It's a matter of trusting in a person, trusting in his promises that are yet unseen, most of them. We have confidence in his word. And that's what we hope in. That's what we believe in because we know it will come to pass. To remember, biblical faith isn't faith in faith or hoping in hope. It's not wishful thinking. It's not just believing something for the sake of believing something, but it is something that is rational. It is something that is logical. It is something that reasonable. And I would add, kind of borrow from C.S. Lewis, it's the only thing that rationally makes sense. It's the only thing that makes sense. Let me give you just a quick example here. Acts 26. Acts 26. We're going to look at verse 19. The great apostle Paul, right? He's, he's in chains and he's getting a, ch- a chance to, to defend himself with uh, the governor Festus and, and King Agrippa. And so he's talking and in verse 19, he's, uh, he says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. But I declared, of course, he's talking about when Christ came to him, the road to Damascus experience, verse 20. But I declared first to those in Damascus. Then I went into Jerusalem throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles. And this is what I said. You need to repent and turn to God and live like it, right? Perform deeds in keeping with that repentance. Verse 21, for this reason, the Jews, they seized me in the temple and they tried to kill me. Because I'm preaching about Jesus. Verse 22, to this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. This isn't new, right? This is God's continued revelation of himself. And this is what it is, that the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king, prophet, priest must suffer and that by being the first to, here's the killer for them, rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and the Gentiles. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus was like with a loud voice, whoa, 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 Paul, Paul, you are out of your mind. This is an interesting phrase. Your great learning. You understand, they're not treating Paul like he's some troll that just came under a bridge right? Like he's the town drunk and like, oh, you can't listen to anything he said because he's cuckoo. They recognized that Paul was at the top of his game, right? He was the next junk. He is a very educated, a very thoughtful, well-reasoned person. Festus knows this, but Festus is like, dead people can't live again. You're crazy, Paul. You're crazy. Your great learning has made you mad driving you out of your mind. Verse 25. I love this. But Paul says, nah, 
I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. Look at this. I am speaking true and rational words. Then he, 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 he goes for Agrippa. For the king knows about these things, and it's to him that I am speaking boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice. This isn't make-believe. This isn't fairy tales. I'm not drunk. This isn't, you know, illogical, Ill, Ill, unrational things, right? He knows these things. Look at this. For none of this has been done in a corner. I love that. You guys understand, Jesus' resurrection wasn't, in the dark where nobody knew about it. The, the Bible says at one time he showed himself to 500 people preaching. This was the talk of the town. A dead man raised himself back to life. That's why this was the, the, the central theme of the message of the apostles because everybody was talking about it. They're like, no, 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 no. Jay, what? No, people don't come back to life. Jesus came back to life. And he says, these things were not, they didn't escape your notice. They weren't done in a corner. A, a King Agrippa, he says, do you believe the prophets? Oh, I know that you believe, right? He's bringing them. And Agrippa says, whoa, 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 Paul, in this short amount of time, do you think you're going to be able to persuade me to be a Christian? Paul says, I'm going to try, <laughs> right? Whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains, I know it's a roundabout way for me to say, but I think it's really important for you and I that profess to be people of the Bible, that we're honest with ourselves on whether or not we have a genuine biblical faith, that we're understanding what that means. It means that we have a confident trust in God, a confident trust in his word and in his promises, even in things unseen. I don't see forgiveness but I know I'm forgiven because God has said so. Christian faith isn't this blind, foolish, silly, silly thing. Biblical faith is, is based on a confident trust in the true and rational words from a very real and true God. Personally, I like that definition for us. Biblical faith is a confident trust in God. Partly, because I hear people all the time trying to tell me that they believe in God or that they have faith because they know some scripture, because they believe some facts about God or, or the Christian faith. They know some doctrine. But I can't help as I, I look at this to wonder, is it a real biblical faith that we're talking about? As I was thinking about this, I... I don't have time. I've used this analogy before because in my opinion, it is a great example of what biblical faith is. And last time I used the analogy, I had my good friend, Bill. Hey, Bill. Bill's gonna be in this analogy a little bit more and I'm gonna try to make it mean even more than the first time I did it, right? Mr. Gene, you're right in front, so I'm gonna use you. You guys may not know this, but Mr. Gene is an incredible tightrope walker. I'm talking like legit. As a matter of fact, he, he went over the Grand Canyon and he did it with one foot, just hopped along, one foot on this little string. He did cartwheels, he did backflips. The dude is freaking awesome. Awesome, right? <laughs> Amen. I believe it, right? Bill, Bill's like, I saw that on TV. That was incredible. And I, I say, Bill, do you believe Gene is an incredible tightrope walker? Bill knows the facts. He's had 200 walks. He's never failed once. Bill says, I believe. I believe, Bill, do you have faith that Gene Miller can take this wheelbarrow with 200 pounds of rocks and make it across hopping on one foot? And Bill's like, you bet it. I believe it. I've seen that guy. He's amazing. And don't you know, Mr. Gene, because he's incredible, makes it across that tightrope. And, and Bill's like, see, see, I told you, I told you, I told you. Mr. Gene comes back with an empty wheelbarrow. And I'm like, do you really, 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 really believe now, Bill, that Gene 
is incredible at what he's done, what he's doing. Bill's like, oh, I believe, I believe. Bill, get in the wheelbarrow. And let Gene hop on one foot with a wheelbarrow above the Grand Canyon with no nets, no water, no nothing but rocky bottom. It's one thing for you and I to say that we believe it's altogether different for you and I to get in the wheelbarrow, to entrust all of our lives to the God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. Let me take it a step for, further. Bill might say, okay, well, yeah, okay, I, I might get in the thing. He's looking, is there nets? Is there a net? Bill, put Henry in the wheelbarrow. Put Henry in the wheelbarrow. Henry, if you don't know, is his little grandson. Pride and joy, right? Bill's like, you try to take him, punch you in your face. <laughs> I ain't putting that baby in the wheelbarrow. I'm trying to make us feel. It is super easy for us to be in this world and say, yeah, I believe in God. And we don't ever even try to get in the wheelbarrow. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Bible is saying biblical faith isn't just saying something, but it's doing something. Leads me to my second point as we get ready to close. The second thing that we see about faith here is that not only is it a confident trust in God, but it is a confident trust that leads us to action. Bill says, I believe. He straps on Henry in a book sack, right? And he sits down in the barrel and says, let's go, Gene. He has complete confidence and it leads to action. Amen? That's good preaching. In Hebrews 11, as we make our way through this chapter, you're gonna see over and over and over again, if you didn't already, the phrase, by faith. By faith, so-and-so did something. By faith, this confident trust, this assurance, this conviction, they did this, they did that, such and such and such and such. Look at verse two again, real quick. For by it, this kind of faith, that they didn't just trust, but it led to this action. The people of old received their approval from God, commendation. They were approved not because they felt something. They weren't approved just because they believed some facts, like, yeah, Gene can make it across but because they did something, they responded to that trust. Because of their confident trust in God and his promise and in his words, they moved to action. It was something that changed their lives. Letter B, as we work to understand this idea of biblical faith, we see that not only is it a confident trust, letter A, and uh, a confident trust in God, but letter B, it is a confident trust that leads us to action. It is a confident trust that leads to action. And I think this is a, a key component of biblical faith. As a matter of fact, I'm not the first person to talk about it like this. James uses a different illustration, and I'd like us to look at his illustration. James chapter 2. I'm running just a couple minutes behind, but you guys are okay, right? Because it feels good? Some of you have already fallen asleep. And you got sunglasses on and you know I can't even tell. You're like, good preaching, good preaching. Well, let's look at this. James recognized this even in the early church, right? Let's say James was written maybe somewhere around 45, 46 AD. I mean, this is really early in the beginning of the church. James is noting everybody wants to say they're a Christian. Everybody wants to say they have faith. James chapter two, verse 14. James, talking to this new church, says, what good is it, my brothers, if somebody says they have faith, but they don't have works? Is that biblical faith? Is that really the kind of faith that can save him? And then he gives us an example. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and they lack in daily food, one of you, 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 you see this, you know their state, right? You know the reality and the truth. You see this and you say, Go in peace, my brother. Be warmed and filled. Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? You see, James is saying it's not a matter of just knowing something. Right? It's not a matter of just knowing their state and, and seeing those realities and, and having a mental assent of, I recognize that's the truth and that's the reality, right? 
It doesn't matter if it's not something that leads you to an action, to giving the guy a coat and a cheeseburger, right? Verse 17, so also faith by itself, just knowing something, if it doesn't have actions, if it doesn't have works, is dead. You believing that God is one, awesome. You do well. That's biblical truth. That's theology. That's fact. Even the demons know it. They believe it and they shudder. But there is nothing there that is biblical faith that leads them to action. Right? Just because they know the reality and the truth of God doesn't mean they're right with God and that God is pleased with them. True biblical faith is so much more than just us acknowledging the truth of God but it's about us surrendering our lives to that truth, getting in the wheelbarrow. It's about us obeying those truths and that reality. Verse 20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, person, that faith apart from works is useless? What a good thought. We profess to be Christians, that we have this confident trust in God and in his word and his promises as where our hope is and the things unseen. I gotta ask, right? How does your faith make a difference in your life? Does it make any difference in your life? How does your effect, how does your, your faith, right? This biblical trust in God that leads you to action. How does it operate? How do you see it in your work? What about your relationships? How do you see that being played out with your spouse, with your kids? How does your faith affect your parenting? I couldn't help but think of this as I thought about parenting. My parents used to say it all the time. I guarantee you, yours did too. And you probably told your kids, actions speak louder than words, right? Right? I remember doing a similar study like this with the kids in in children's church and I was just aggravating the the fire out of them because it's fun. But I kept telling them I'm a fish. I'm a fish. No, you're not a fish, you're a person. No, I'm a fish. Don't tell me I'm not a fish, I'm a fish. And I started telling them, I believe I'm a fish. I believe I'm a fish, I believe I'm a fish. And finally they're like, you don't live in the water. You don't have gills. You don't look like a fish. You don't act like a fish. You don't do anything like a fish, but yet I'm professing to be a fish. Booyah, buddy. You don't do anything to act like a Christian. You don't think like a Christian. You might believe a couple of Christian things, but you ain't a Christian. Yeah, I know. I was preaching hard to the kids. Well, they need to hear it just like we need to hear it. Actions speak louder than words. Actually, did you know that's biblical? Titus 1.16. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. Their actions are louder than their profession. So as we look at biblical faith this morning, we see that it is a confident trust in God, a confident trust in his word and in his promises. It is a confident trust that affects our lives. It changes us. It leads us to action. It's something that affects all of our lives but I would like to close just mentioning this one point one more time. Another aspect of this biblical faith that we see in our text that I think is just fascinating. The Bible says that this kind of faith is something that pleases God. It's something that he desires to reward in our lives. Look again at verse two. For by it, the people of old They had this confident trust, led them to action. By that faith, they received their approval from God. Commendation, verse six, without this kind of faith, it is impossible for us to please God. For for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. You see, this life of faith, confident trust that leads us to action is the only life that pleases God. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that fascinating? So I know for me, as I'm reading this text and studying, I don't want to just rush through this, but I want to examine myself. Am I a person of true biblical faith like this? 
Right? Can my wife and my kids look at me and say, wow, he doesn't just preach on Sunday, but he lives on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Right? Are my actions speaking something totally different than my words? How is this so-called biblical faith that I have that so life-changing, how is it really changing my life that coworkers see it? Spouses, family members see it. This confident trust that I have in God. By their faith, they pleased God. And by their faith, they were rewarded. Once again, what an amazing thought. God has said he's gonna reward our faith, our faithful service. We ended last week with this idea. I said, remember expecting great things from God? Attempting great things for God? It fits here too, doesn't it? Sums up nicely. It's an assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things unseen. I am expecting great things from God. Biblical faith is something that, in that confident faith, that leads me to action. I am attempting great things for God. Because he has promised. Isn't that a good thought? Biblical faith that pleases God. Biblical faith that he wants to reward in our lives is that confident trust in him and his promises and his words that leads us to expect great things from him. It's also that confident faith that leads us to attempt great things for him. Because he who promised is faithful. Can the worship team come up? So as we get ready to close our time this morning in this, with this song, let me ask you, does your faith, your confident trust in God, is that something that is leading you in your life and just this season of your life to expect great things from him? Does your faith, this confident trust in God that you have, is it something that is leading you right now in your life to action, to obedience to God? Is it something that is leading you in your life to attempt great things for God? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for once again holding off the rain and blessing our time together to to look at your word God, we, uh, in this moment, as we get ready to close, thank you for the message today. Lord, as, as we evaluate our own hearts and, and where we're at and looking at this idea of biblical faith, God, am I expecting great things from you right now? Am I trusting in you the way that I should be? God, not only that, but Is my faith in you affecting my life to where I'm surrendering to you? I'm walking in obedience to you. Or I can't help but think right now that there's somebody here, a brother and sister, Lord, you've told them to do something and they're just not doing it. God, may today be the day that we get that right. Some of us here, we might be convicted as we think, wow, you know what? I I really do believe in God and and, and I do believe in, in these creeds and these truths, but I've not allowed it to change my heart and affect the way I live my life. <laughs> my words are a lot louder than my actions. Maybe today is the day that you get that right with God. Father, I pray once again, For those that are here, thank you for this time. We ask your blessings upon our uh, closing worship time. In the name of Jesus, amen.